you're interested in not being alone and tackling life's problems, if you're tired of trying to do all the praying and witnessing on your own and you see the scripture always with a body of believers, then fellowship is something that you probably would be interested in. But if you're happy with the do it on your own, tired of uh, forgiving other people and dealing with other people's ideas and listening and and sorting things through with a, a group of people, then fellowship in the corporate American religion is perfect for you, where you can um, have the rugged individualist Duke John Wayne mentality, and you will have zero interest in reading the Bible with um, um, the prayer of Jesus, of having the world recognize his disciples by their love one for another. That will be of zero interest for you to love um, doing things God's way. But um, stay tuned if you're interested in listening to what I have to say on biblical fellowship. Could you imagine a fellowship that actually mirrors some of what you see in the scripture instead of something artificial that you go through each Sunday, each Wednesday, where you talk about the weather, you talk about kids, you talk about things that really have very little to do with the functioning of the kingdom of God. It has everything to do with just being human. You could talk about that at work. You could talk about that to your neighbor. It's great. It's wonderful conversation, but it does not involve any of the direction that you see of the 66 books in the Bible focused on a specific target that most humans want to avoid, which is sincere fellowship of overcoming sin, connecting to God, staying free from hypocrisy. Could you imagine having a fellowship that was built slowly over time, that was totally natural, it wasn't, you didn't have to go to a conference, you didn't have to uh, listen to a bunch of tapes, you didn't have to listen to a long YouTube um, boring guy from Alaska, but it could be something that you could implement right away. And what I've found has been just from jur- Journal of John Wesley, where he and George Whitfield did this during the Holy Club, they focused on several things, and I'm going to focus on just three, of repenting, of turning from sin, would be the first part of fellowship. And the format would be you'd meet with someone uh, as you're walking with them uh, to their car and just ask them these three questions. And, you know, if done right, it would take about 10, 15 minutes per person, um, probably even longer. But what are some sins that you've, you are going to get victory over this week? You, you hate it. You're not going back. And it's not just an honesty question. It's not just, oh, I'm just being honest, but I have no intention of changing. This is, I am going to change no matter what type thing. And so you pray with them about that, lay hands on them. And then the second thing that you would do for this fellowship of, of what the John Wesley would call the Holy Club would be the method of just looking at the mechanics of how to relate to an invisible God. How did he draw near to you that week? What are some ways that you drew near to him? And listen to their answer. Listen to what they have to say and make some comments if it seems appropriate. And, And then the third would be the focus, obviously, the first two is on loving God and him loving you. And the third would be to love your neighbor as yourself type question. How and who have you witnessed to this week? Not last year, not last month, but this week. And if you haven't, then that's sin. You know, that's our job is to be salt and light. And if you're fellowshipping with people that have no interest in doing these three things, then you, you'll realize how rare this is, what I'm talking about, and how much they would re- much rather talk about gardening or other things that you could talk about with anyone, saint or sinner. And so one of the obstacles that I've seen to this type of fellowship is that, oh, this is, this is, you, you are here to just be entertained. You're an audience. You sit and listen to me preach. No reply is needed. Just sit, pay your tithes, shut up and go home. And this type of fellowship that I'm proposing really offended the Church of England. They really went out of their way to give John and Charles a hard time. Um, And eventually, when they started allowing people that weren't ordained to preach, that was the final straw. 
But for years and years, they got away with making just a club where it was, it was kind of under the radar. There wasn't a church per se. And they used this type of method to just encourage people to not become hypocrites like they were in the Church of England. Filled with alcohol, filled with, you know, if marijuana was legal back then, then they would have totally been using that. Um, and I think it was legal back then. There was opiates and stuff like that. Um, and then I think another obstacle that you'll see, a second obstacle, is that most feel that God needs to do all this type of fellowship, that this is somehow getting so specific with someone is in doing the Holy Spirit's work for them. And there's really no example of that in Scripture where you see James, you see Peter, you see Jude, you see Paul really rebuking people and, and expecting them to overcome those things. How did they find out about those people in First Timothy, uh, what those 15 characteristics of elders and deacons, unless they knew them, unless they had questions like this where they voluntarily described how things were going in their spiritual life. And so the idea that this is only God's territory absolutely has zero weight in the scriptures. What does have weight is a th movement called the shepherding movement, where that is unbiblical. They were telling people who they could marry, who they could not marry, whether they could marry at all, what kind of car they could drive. I mean, that's Amish. That's, that's just weird. Uh, that's Muslim. That's Sharia law. So that that's, doesn't hold any weight in terms of the three things that are voluntarily. This is a fellowship that, that is not required. And, and, and I mean, that's, that's, that's the weird part, is the Methodists did make that required. And it was, hey, this is, we're not playing games here. We're not here to talk about how much better we are than the Church of England. We're, tr we're here to get to, to know Christ and to do His work. And so it, it was a voluntary thing. They gave permission slips to people to be able to come or not. And if they weren't growing in God's grace, they were just being entertained. They were kicked out of that club. And so was it a shepherding movement control? No, it was a, it was a, a gate of this is who is part of our fellowship and these are the people that are not. They're just in it, wanting to be entertained. They're wanting to see people, the excitement of God moving in other people, but they don't want to be moved themselves. And one of the last things that you'll see as an obstacle to this is just plain old emotions. People don't feel like doing this. This is uh, uh, very common amongst the charismatic in particular, that unless the Holy Spirit is doing this, unless the Holy Spirit just magically makes this fellowship happen, you know, unless you vote the same color that I vote, unless you see things on uh, your entertainment for four-wheelers or hunting, unless you're... Uh, of the same mindset that I'm just, I'm just not going to ever fellowship with you. And what you'll see all through the New Testament is Jesus purposely picking stories of the Good Samaritan being the good guy amongst the, the Jews who were listening to who was their good neighbor. Picking Matthew as one of the disciples totally offended Peter and James and John and people that daily had to pay their, their fishing taxes to, to, to Matthew. That, that was on purpose. And you'll see just all through the New Testament where the Greeks and the, and the Jewish people bumped heads and they were being tried to get under the law of Moses again. That, the, all those things are very intentional, very on purpose, and have everything to do with making feelings important but not running the show. Overcoming feelings of prejudice, as James talks about, overcoming um, feelings and picking up your cross and loving people that are different than you is all what Paul talks about, being all things to all people. And so try this. Look at this and say, yeah, this is, this is much better than just talking about things that I could talk about uh, a person who's going to hell. I could even talk about this stuff with the devil, and he, it would be fine to talk about what kind of chainsaw you use to split and stack wood. and Not that you use a chainsaw to split wood, but to cut down trees. And There's, there's absolutely no eternal value to that. It's important information, but this three things that I'm talking about, repenting, how you're going to turn away from sin, how God's been drawing near to you and you've been drawing near to God, and who you've been witnessing to, how that's impacted them, and how you need some en encouragement. Hey, could you even come with me and let's witness this person together? Those are eternal questions. Those are things 
that really define uh, just the beginnings of a basic fellowship. There's other things that you could do that we'll go over some other time. But these three things are just a, an incredible start. So try it sometimes, see what happens. Uh, don't be surprised if you get zero interest in this. I've been after this with a little Nazarene fellowship here in Two Rivers and zero interest. And I mean like almost angry, not interested. So don't be surprised if uh, if you take some time to find some people that are, are totally out of your circle. Some of the people that we've been able to kind of do this with, <laughs> one of them is Carol, that whom you've seen on the YouTube channel. She's 76 years old. She was really the last person that I ever expected to be interested in this. Um, but now she's hooked. She she looks forward to this. And Between Charlotte, Carol, and I, it takes forever because we um, have to put up with me talking all the time. No, kidding. Carol and I usually do take up most of the oxygen in the room. But it's very fruitful and very helpful and keeps us um, connected to God and to each other, which is all of what we see in the body of Christ. All right, well, hopefully this is helpful. Give it a try and tell me what your experience is.